Today we're going to be practicing and refining our coding skills by refactoring the same function a bunch of different ways. Why? Because it's fun and you'll learn a lot from doing this. I called this channel Train to Code not just because it's a pun about trains and trains are awesome but also because I really wanted to highlight that software engineering is a skill and therefore it's something that you need to practice. This isn't just learning a bunch of stuff and then repeating it back in the job interview. This is practicing and refining a skill or craft. A bit like a tennis player will practice hitting a ball over and over again until they can serve at 150 miles an hour. Going over the basics of coding over and over again really is the best way to build up these kinds of skills. For the knowledge part, you've always got Google. And so it's these core coding skills that I want to try and concentrate on through this YouTube channel. And this video is all about improving those core basic skills. For this exercise, we're going to take a function and we're going to rewrite it a bunch of times. The function I'm going to write for this is going to take in an array of football teams and matches that they've played over a season and it's going to print out the league table. Now I'm British so when I say football I'm referring to association football or soccer by the way and the English Premier League or most professional leagues actually has a scoring system like this. Each match that you win, you get three points for. Each match that you draw, you get one point for. And then you get no points for matches that you lose. And it's this scoring system that we're going to implement in our function. So let me show you how I've got all this set up um, for my development environment. Now, in here, I've got Visual Studio Code. And in VS Code, you can see I've got this display table function that we're going to be putting our function code inside. Now this is TypeScript, so I've set up VS Code with a launch.json that tells it to do a TypeScript build using my local tsconfig.json configuration settings. And then it's going to run this other file here, test.ts. Test.ts is going to load up the data of my Premier League football teams, which comes from this data.json file I've got on the right hand side here. As you can see, each Premier League team is an object with a name, the number of matches that they've won, the number of matches that they've drawn, and the number of matches that they've lost. The test function will take in this data JSON, which I'm just importing like this, uh, and it will cast it to, it will say it's an array of this team interface here. So as you can see, I've declared the type with name worn, one drawn and lost here, based on what's in my data file. It will then execute it and expect the result to look like this. So this is our string table and this is what we're going to be producing from every single iteration of our function. We've got the position in the table, so number four, the name of the team, Tottenham Hotspur, and the number of points they got based on their wins, losses and draws. Um, we can test this out if we just go into test.ts and we just push F5 or start the debugger on the left hand side. You can see down at the bottom here, Visual Studio Code will begin to compile TypeScript and then it will put up a breakpoint inside display table. So it will jump into our breakpoint and obviously the test at the minute will fail. You can see if I hover over teams here, you can see that it's loaded in the teams and it's passing in all the JSON objects. So this is a good starting point. What we're going to go from here is we're going to implement the first version of this display table function. I'm not going to put a huge amount of thought into the first version of this because obviously we're going to be refactoring this in later iterations. So the first version, I'm just going to think logically, what are the processes, what are the steps we're going to go through to take this teams array and output a string of teams. So let me just stop this here. You can actually see if I do this, it will say failed. There we go. So let's begin to write our first version. We'll just delete this return to do. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our teams array and project that into a new array that has all the information about the team, but it also has the score that that team attained through their wins and draws. So we can create a new array like this. We'll call it teams with points. So we're going to use the uh, union operator here in TypeScript to say that this teams of points is going to be of team 
object, like, like as a user, like a prototype, and then it's going to have a new property on it called points, which we're going to calculate on the fly. Let's initialize that to a new array and then start looping through our teams. Now for every team, we're going to go in teams of points and push a new item into that. And we're going to use the spread operator to copy all of the information from the team and then add in this new points field. Now this is where we're going to do the calculation. So we're going to say team dot one multiplied by three because you get three points for a win plus team dot drawn multiplied by one. Obviously we don't need the multiply by one there, but this is just to demonstrate that you get one point for a draw and three points for a win. Next thing, we're gonna sort this teams of points based on our new field. So we can do teams of points dot sort, and we'll pass a predicate in here that basically just compares the uh, new points field from B minus A. What that'll do is it will sort it descending. So you will have the team with the highest number of points at the top and the team with the lowest number of points at the bottom. Next, we're gonna build our resulting string. If we go back to the test.ts, you can see what we want, uh, what we expect from this function. We expect to see the position in the table, then the name of the team, and then the number of points that they've got with a new line after each row. This is kind of like how you might see a table presented on the news or something like that. So we're gonna go um, create initialize to an empty string, and then we're gonna loop through again. This time I'm gonna use um, an indexer, so I'm gonna use i, and the reason is then I'll be able to easily say, you know, i plus one is the first team in the list, and so I'll be able to put that into my template string. So let's do that. Plus equals here is the append to string operator. So we'll do, like I just said, i plus one. So that'll be position one, then position two, then position three. Then we'll do team.name. Oh, no, sorry, teams. And then. And then we can return this result and this should now work. Uh, let's try this, save it, and I'll go back into test.js and push F5. And step through our code in TypeScript as we did before and see if it reduces our expected result. You'll be able to look in the console down here and you'll be able to see it compiling, running, and skip through my breakpoint, and there we go, it's passed. So if you look at the bottom of test, you can see that we are console logging the result that we get. So here is the result we get, and as you can see, we've got First team, Manchester City, 93 points. Second team, Liverpool, 92 points. And this 92 is calculated based on 28 here, 28 times three plus eight times one. So there we have it. Let's quickly recap on what we've written here in our purely procedural implementation that we're gonna call level one of this function. The first part here maps the teams from the JSON file into a new object that contains the calculated points total for each team. And we do that calculation as we map them just down here. Next, we're gonna sort the array based on that new points field in a descending order. And then finally, we loop through that sorted array and we write out the string rows for each of the final Premier League results table into this results variable here. Now, this is where the fun starts. Let's have a look at these three parts of the function and start to apply our creative mind and think about different ways that we can approach this function. So how about, for example, we use object-oriented programming? That's a thing, right? So why don't we try to apply some object-oriented programming principles to this function and create some objects? And we can use those objects to wrap internal state and to expose a simpler interface to the outside world. And that's how object-oriented programming basically works. So let's think about object or in programming with this display table. What can we do? So to do object oriented, obviously we can create a class. We've already got an interface here. So what we can do is we can implement that interface. And in the constructor, we'll actually declare our properties inline. So we'll say it's gonna have a property called string that is passed 
called name that is passed into the constructor. And then the same for one. Okay, so all we've done here is we've taken our object and we've put it into a class and we've mapped the object properties into properties inside our class. But this is where we can use the advantages we have of this class, which is we can create the points field as a read-only field inside the class. So if we do get points like this, and then we can do return this dot one times three. So we're doing our calculation here, basically. And one of the nice things about doing object-oriented programming is we can start to put some comments and documentation and things on here. So let's put a comment on this that just says, uh, get the points for this team. There we go. Now we'll be able to go into our display table function and instead of putting everything into this kind of slightly messy array here with this um, unioned object, we can make this an array of team class objects. So let's just call this, instead of teams of points, let's call this uh, team objects. And we don't need to do this down here in this loop. We can actually just declare team objects in line using the map function from teams. So we'll go teams.map it's an equals, sorry, teams.map new team class. And then I'm just going to replace team object with team teams of points with team object. The rest of our function can stay exactly the same. All we've done is we've taken out that first step and we've made it look a lot simpler in our function by taking advantage of our team class. Now you'll note down here that this points, I can hover over points and say, get the points from this team. That's coming from our property up here. So we've made it a little bit more self document by uh, documenting by adding this um, comment on here in this property. But largely this is working exactly the same as it did before and we should be able to do debugger and we should be able to run this and get the same results we were getting before. Great. Let's compare now this new object oriented approach with the original. You can see that we've simplified this first section quite a bit through the use of our class. Now I'm not suggesting either of these two approaches is better, remember? Each of these approaches has its merits. The one on the left here is simpler, the one on the right is more extensible. So neither of these is wrong, but the skill that we're practicing here is the ability to move between these two styles of coding um, and produce the same results. And that's really what this is all about. It's about uh, the breadth of knowledge of doing these two different approaches and just learning how to do each one. So let's carry on going then. Let's do a third version of this that we're gonna call version three. Now during the second version, we had this class for the team. The next logical step, if you want to continue down object-oriented coding, will be to create a class for the league table itself as well. So if we have a class called league table, and we'll pass in an array of the teams into that. So this is like that's being passed into our function. And then we can put our sort method inside league table. So league table knows how to sort the teams. It's gonna sort them by score. So we'll put that and we'll uh, encapsulate that logic inside this class here. We can also create a read-only property that gets the rows in order. So we'll say get rows and return We can also create a new function that gets the rows and maps the index of the team to a new property on the row called row number. So this is gonna avoid us having to use that indexer in the for loop in the first version. So we'll call this row number and it will be index plus one.
So with our league table class, we can go back into the display table where we're sorting our team object classes. And we can remove this and say, actually, we want a new table object, which is going to be of type league table. And we'll place our teams into that. Then we just do table.sort, because remember we encapsulated the sorting logic inside the table class. So there we go. Everything else is just as it was before. Although actually here, we don't need this index that we said. We can just go for a row of table.rows. And this was our read-only property. If I can F12 into this, you can see that it's this read-only property here. And then this will be row dot row number, row number, row dot name, and row dot points. Okay, that's the third version. Let's just run that. And that's passed as well, producing the same result as before. Okay, so here we have version three next to version two, and you can see that we've abstracted that sorting comparison out of our display table function. Again, just like last time, neither of these approaches is necessarily better, they're just different. Right, so let's have a think about fourth iteration of this function. So we've simplified this first part here, then we've simplified the second part. Let's try and tackle this part here. It's a little bit horrible still having this format string inside this function. Um, and there's probably a way that we can abstract that and make it a bit more reusable. Again, not better, just different. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a static function inside, let's just put it inside lead table. It can be anywhere this though really. And we're gonna call this format row. And this is gonna be where we put our format string down here. The row will be of the type that's returned from this. So it will be, it will have a row number and it will have a team. And what we can just do is return the row. I actually just copy and paste this format string here. So we know we're not even gonna change it. So I'll take that format string and I'll return it from this format row function. Um, we haven't done a huge amount of changing here. All we've just done is abstract it out. I can even put a, uh, I could put a comment on here if I wanted to. It shouldn't be hugely, um, it shouldn't be hugely difficult to work out what this is doing. But we will say that the formats the row, the way a table wants it. Okay. And then down here we can replace this whole section by just saying. Um, result we can just directly project it so we can say table dot rows dot map and then inside the map function we put league table dot format row now we're not actually going to call this here what we're going to do is pass in um, a reference to the function so we're taking advantage here of the fact that functions are first class citizens in javascript so by passing it in like this without putting brackets after it remember we're just passing in a reference to this function so it just happens that the signature of this format row function matches the signature that's required by the map function. So that's all we have to do there. And then we'll join these with a new line character. And we're done. Let's just test that out. All right, so here's version four next to version three. And you can see that the last part is a little bit easier to scan as well. It helps that we have this name here, format row, to sort of document what this part of the code is doing. You don't even really need to use that comment that I added onto it. It's formatting the row. This is what people mean when they talk about self-documenting code. The function names and things like that explain what the code is doing. And so you don't have to have anything on the left or the right. We just have a nice function name that documents what this is all doing itself. Right, that's four versions of this function done. Now we've covered purely procedural code, which was the first one, and then we've done three versions of a progressively more um, complex object-oriented design. But object-oriented programming is not the catch-all solution that for a long time people thought it was. This isn't the video where I'm gonna have a rant about object-oriented programming designs, but just know that there are other approaches to writing clean code um, other than just creating objects for absolutely everything. 
So for version five of this function, we're gonna get rid of all of those classes. We're gonna start from the beginning and we're gonna use functional programming. Functional programming is loosely defined as an approach to designing code around pure functions. What are pure functions? A pure function is a function that follows two main rules. It must always produce the same output for a given input, and it must not have any side effects. So our display table function here we've been working with is actually a pure function. We always return the same string for the same array of teams that are passed in, and we aren't affecting anything outside the scope of this function. So let's keep that paradigm live and go ahead and refactor out our logic into simple, pure functions. So first, let me just delete all of this object-oriented stuff we did. In fact, I'm just going to delete everything and we'll start again, like I say, we'll start completely from the beginning. And let's just think about some functions. So let's do a functional first approach with this. Let's think of what we might need. I think we're going to need a function that calculates a score. So this is going to be similar to the read-only score property that we had on our object, but we're not using objects this time. We're just using pure functions. We could also have that format row function that we had before. That was a good one. But again, it's not going to be on a class or anything. It's just going to be a pure function called format row. There we go. And the last thing we could probably have a function for comparing. So when we're doing the sorting, there was that b.points minus a.points, that could probably be a function. So we'll probably call that compare team for sort. And compare team for sort is gonna call off to calculate score. So we wanna calculate a score for team B minus calculate score for team A. There we go. And lastly, let's have a function to do the actual sorting itself. Now, <clears throat> the dot sort function on array in JavaScript mutates the array, and that's not a very functional programming approach. So instead of having a function called like sort array or sort teams, we're going to do this function called get sorted that follows the no side effects approach, and it isn't going to mutate this team's object. So this function, we're going to pass in an array of teams, and it's going to return a new array of teams that's not the same as the one that was passed in, but the new array will be sorted. So in order to do that, we will need to clone this array and then we can sort the cloned version. Again, we'll use the fact that it's a first class citizen. We'll just pass in compare team for sort. Not quite sure why that's not working. It's not working because I didn't return it, see? So this function here should match the same signature of the sort function. And it wasn't working before because I was forgetting to return it. So it said that it was um, a return type void, but actually I wanted it to be a return type number. So there we go. Okay, so let's write our display table function using these new um, pure functions that we've created for our functional approach. So the first thing to do is to sort our teams. get sorted and then we can map those into some rows and then we can return our rows these will be strings Let's just hover over that. That should say that they're strings, yeah. And then we can turn our rows dot um, join with a new line character. So here you go. This is our functional approach. I will just run this because obviously we've had to rewrite it from scratch, but we should find that this does exactly the same as the previous two, three, four approaches. As you, oh, why has it failed? 
Hmm. Okay. Why is the file? What's wrong with that? Um, okay. That's failed because this time we don't have a new line at the end of that. So I'll take that new line off and it will pass. Okay, so here's a recap of this functional approach. All of our logic is held up in these functions at the top here. Each of these functions could be unit tested very easily. They could be moved out into some external file or some external package even. So you can imagine all of these functions in some kind of library, and then we just import into our code the ones that we want. So if you've ever used underscore.js or lodash, then you'll recognize this kind of approach where you just have a massive library of functions and you just import the ones you need into your JavaScript or your TypeScript file. So that's functional programming. Uh, let's take a look at the display table function here as well, because all we're really doing here is executing functions and passing the result of one function into the next. It makes it actually pretty readable and easy to understand. This is also very self-documenting because we can name these functions as something that makes sense, like get started, sorted, or calculate score. And the function names will act like our documentation. But we still aren't done. I've got a sixth version of this function for you because the function we have here is actually can be reduced down to just one line of code. Yes, if you really wanted to impress slash annoy your colleagues, you can actually take that functional version that we had previously and do this to it. This is the same function, but without the intermediary variables. So the result of get sorted gets piped straight into the map function and the result of the map function gets piped straight into the string join and it returns a result. And that's where I want to leave you with just one line of code. It can be fun to set yourself a challenge whenever you do a coding cutter or something like that to see if you can refactor it into just one kind of code like this. And again, I'm not suggesting this is better. I'm not suggesting that any of these approaches here are better than any others. I'm just suggesting that if you do this, it's a really, really good form of practice. I'll leave a couple of links to coding cutters and coding problems around the internet that I think will be fun for you to try out for yourself. Um, or you can find the code from this video on our GitHub. So that's githubcurse.com slash train to code. So check this out and play around with it. And most importantly, experiment. This is a really, really good way to learn. My name is James Charlesworth. If you've enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to the channel. If you really liked it, then why not pop a little comment down below and say hello. I will get back to everybody because this is still a very small YouTube channel and um, I definitely have the time to be reading and replying to every comment on these videos. So happy with factoring and I'll see you in the next video.